Okay, let's go ahead and get ourselves going again. Where we had left off, we were starting to think about heating and cooling systems and really creating spaces and zones and trying to use those to uh, figure out how much heating and cooling we need. The side of really, oh, basically how we're going through and completing, creating demand, yeah, you know, we sort of took care of that a little bit in that we took care of our internal loads. That's the ones that are from all the people and the equipment and the lighting and all that kind of stuff. All the heat that we're generating. Now we actually want to go through and kind of think about the external loads. The external loads are really created by a combination of both the climate conditions and the thermal properties of all our uh, kind of exterior surfaces. They're separating us from that climate. So how we go through and factor that stuff in is as follows. Oops, maybe forgot, I'll also address this while we're here. We have this whole issue of heating and cooling and set points, and we can go through and like uh, start working with those. I just kind of try playing around with some very basic things. My little basic building here, which is in Boston, where the cooling set points would be at 74, the heating set points currently at 70, which is in sort of a very narrow range. If I just ran the report right now, and I didn't pay much attention to the whole issue of the thermal properties of the walls, doors, and windows, okay, we'd get a result. Let's kind of talk about where that result is coming from, though. We'll say, let's kind of analyze the heating and cooling loads, as long as my zones are good here. You'll see there's this notion of there being some sort of building construction. Okay, and independent of the fact of whether you've actually gone through and assigned thermal properties, okay, if you just run the heating and cooling reports without sort of doing anything else, it uses something called building construction kind of properties. And under that, you'll see that there's some different sort of settings in here. We have the whole notion of the roof being a four inch lightweight concrete roof, the exterior walls being eight inch, eight inch lightweight concrete block, they have a certain U value, the exterior windows, interior windows, there's all these default values in here. And notice they're all checked right now. It says by default, analysis properties are generated for information model elements. Properties of analytic construction are used when override is selected or model is, information is missing. What that means is anything that is checked here is going to be used instead of your thermal properties. Okay. Or, okay, that's an override is checked, or if model information is missing. That means if you have walls and there are no thermal properties, you'll use this as the value for the walls. If you have windows and you haven't assigned any thermal properties, we'll use these. So the issue is, we tend not to want to have these put in there because we went through and very carefully assigned our thermal properties to the walls before we use ours. So just to kind of see what the impact of that is, let's go and do a couple different things. I'm just going to leave it set to all these default properties and it will give me a number. It won't be a very good number, but it'll be a number. I'm going to change the set points and see how much the number changes is based on changing the set points. And then we'll turn these off so we're going to use our thermal properties as opposed to these thermal properties. So different variations on a theme. So here we are. Again, we have the default building constructions kind of set right here. Building infiltration class. That looks fine. A simple report. Let's go ahead and save these settings. Let me do a calculation. So what this is doing is it's doing an ASHRAE calculation based on sort of oh, all our thermal properties and our zones and spaces and heat flowing in and out and whatever our default HVAC system was. And it's come through and at a high level computed something like this. For the overall building, it's saying that we have a peak cooling total load. Okay, So that's probably sometime in the summertime of 218. We have a peak heating load of around 115. Actually, it's even telling us it's in July at 2 o'clock in the afternoon. We have a peak heating load, which is around 115. Okay, And then within all the different zones, it starts subdividing that up a little bit. So within this, we can start looking at the central hall as one zone. We can come on down and look at the north side rooms. They have the peak cooling load of 88. 
a heating load load of 42. The south side rooms, notice the peak cooling load is a little smaller, which kind of surprises me. Peak heating load is smaller. That actually is consistent with what I would think, because I think the north side rooms would be a little bit colder. So the south side rooms would actually need a little bit more heating in terms of what's going on. But it's also broken down room by room. Actually, this is a simple report, which doesn't give me all the detail. You can sort of say that with the volume, with the peak cooling load, the cooling the CFM, the heating, and the heating CFM is. So we get a lot of information sort of based on this. So this is just sort of based on these heating and cooling set points. At a high point, at a high po uh, that, uh, level way of looking at this, let's just go ahead and record those just so I kind of have them hanging around. Oops. I won't do it there. Get back out of that. All right. What do I got here? So cooling is 218. Heating is, what is it, 115? 116 more or less. Okay, and this is for the case where we have, this was like 74 to 70, and default kind of building, kind of thermal properties. Let's go back and change that around a little bit. So if we went through and re-ran that very same report, but let's change our uh, zones around a little bit. So if we actually allowed the cooling set point to go higher, so if I said that, hey, I wasn't going to turn on the cooling until it was 80 degrees or something like that, which some people probably wouldn't like. I expect that's going to have an effect on my cooling load. But let's go and take a look. Again, it's Boston. We'll sort of see how this plans out. So I'll go through and I'll say analyze. Let's see our heating and cooling loads. So if I went up to 80 to 70 with the default building, Okay, so heating or cooling went down to 206. Okay, in terms of the total heating load or the peak heating load, it's 115. That could still be 115.5 at 6. Now, notice this is not the total amount of heating and cooling. We're not doing that. This is just the peak. So, for the worst case scenario, how bad it has to be to go ahead and handle that worst case scenario. So. The, if I went through and computed the total amount of energy and stuff like that, that would give me it would sort of a more dramatic impact of doing that. If at the same time I said, okay, great, let's go back over to my spaces report and said that, oops, my zone report, I could actually go through and have the heating go a little bit lower, let's say 66 degrees. Or maybe it's kind of interesting. Maybe in the hallway it could be even cooler because people aren't sitting there in the hallway. They're kind of just transitioning through. Okay. You can sort of see we have this calculated heating and cooling load okay, in terms of what's going on there. So if I go through and recalculate this, again, analyze. Let's do some calculating. So 206, notice that didn't change because it was still 80 on the cooling side, but down to like, what is it, 66 or 62. Okay, it's 206, and now my cooling load, is, or my heating load is down to 106. So 
what I'm doing is just sort of messing around with the parameters of how hot or how cold. This is going to affect how big the equipment is that needs to be uh, provided to go through and provide that. It's not saying the total energy consumption, but it's saying how big the peak loads are and what's going on. Okay, so let's try the other thing to do now, and that is really not only just sort of sort of play around with the whole idea of what the set points are, but let's kind of play around with the thermal properties because the thermal properties that are in there by default aren't really all that exciting. Yeah, so if we go through and we put in really good thermal properties, let's see what a big impact that has. So let's come back over, and I'm going to go to well, let's look at the uh, just the three D view first. See how good my building is. Is my building good? I'll tell you in a minute. Uh, where do I want to go to? I want to get to the floor plan. There's my spaces. This might actually be coming out of my linked model, which shouldn't make a difference. I'm trying to select those. What do I need to do? I'll go to a coordination view. See if I can actually get this out. Okay. What do I got here for my brick exterior wall here? Looks like it has an R value of around 54. That's looking pretty good. Let's go through and just make sure all my properties are sort of set up that way, though, so that I really have uh, kind of good properties to work with. Let me go through and I'll change this to a coordination view also, just so I can kind of check those properties. So in terms of the roof right now, what is that set up? That's set up with an RVA of like 58. This is looking pretty good. Even for the floor itself though, just to be certain, let's go through and check that out, because I think I changed that last time here. We were finding as we had thicker and thicker floors that the, or uh, better and better wall properties and window properties, even the slab became a little bit of an issue. So here we have our value of only 0.8. If I wanted to increase that, I might put some insulation in the floor slab or under the floor slab. So let's go ahead and do a little thermal air property down there. I'll just put some rigid insulation under there. Let's say like uh, two inches of that, not two feet. It's interesting, that didn't change it at all. I think I must have a piece of insulation that doesn't have very good properties to it. Oh, because it doesn't, it doesn't have thermal properties. Notice there's no thermal properties associated with it. Let me try this again. Let me change it to polyisocyanurate. Who doesn't love a name like that? Okay, so that'll give it an R value of 15, which is much better. Okay, so I got some pretty good looking thermal properties. So we're thinking, hey, this should have some sort of impact on this like a heating and cooling load. And to check it out, what we can do is actually just run this report and see how it goes. So here's how it works. I put those fabulous properties in there. They're looking pretty good. What I want to do is go back over here to analyze. Say, hey, let's take a look at what's going on here. I think I actually have to do this in two spaces, just to be absolutely certain. What I'm going to do is come over and in the energy settings, and I always sort of get baffled about why things are separated in sort of different places, but let me go to the energy settings. I want to say here, export the full values, and also it's spaces. Okay, I think it'll be fine. It's going to use the thermal properties now. I hope. We'll see. Over here, I'm going to say uh, for the building, let's change that around a little bit. As opposed to having all these turned on as overrides, I'm going to turn them off. Okay, so as opposed to overriding all the values, I really want you to use my values instead. Okay, so say okay. Let's see how this looks. Interesting. 
actually looks much worse. So there's definitely an error in the way I've set it up right now. You notice that uh, my peak cooling and my peak heating is much worse. I'm going to think that's generally wrong. I'm going to think about really where this number is coming from. In terms of why that could be happening, though, it could be happening in sort of a funny way in that sometimes if I have very, very, very tight buildings and I'm not allowing for the air to escape, I'm actually just taking care of all the internal loads that are built up as opposed to actually having them flow in and out. So there's definitely a problem with my analysis right now. So uh, hold on to that thought. This is going to take me a little bit of time to like figure out exactly where the problem is. But in general, going through and turning on the thermal properties does have a good effect on you in terms of doing that. I'll think about there is some setting that I don't quite have turned on just right yet, and I can't think about where it is right now. I'll figure it out. But it's definitely going to elude me for the next few minutes here. So let us not dwell on that. I'll figure out the answer to that in terms of why my load report looks a little bit off right now. In general, we should be able to use the spaces and the thermal properties. But let's talk just a little bit about really, given that you have this information, like you know, how do you actually go through and supply it? So you will calculate a heating and cooling load, hopefully better than I just did. But let's go ahead and say, what do you actually do with that number? So you are basically going to go through and supply some heating and cooling in a number of different ways. And you have a lot of different choices to think about. In terms of the locations, as well as the heat source and the medium, you have some choices. So we could go ahead and provide the heat at the air handler itself and actually go through the heating coils there and blow a lot of hot air through the entire system. We can go through and say that, you know, we're just going to blow air down to the local space where it's used and then heat it there. And that's where VAVs or heat pumps actually come into effect. What we'll do is we'll take air at a fairly moderate temperature and then heat or cool it at the end point to be very close to what needs to be in that specific room. The advantage of a, a, a system like that is that as opposed to having a series of air handlers with the different temperature demand, or the demands, you have a single air handler and then the VAV or the heat pump at the end will go through and heat or cool as needed for the individual room. We also have the ability to kind of do it really right in the room where we could go through and have room heaters, either gas or electric. I think a lot of us have in our homes a little electric heater sitting in the bathroom or something like that to kind of heat up a very cold space on cold winter mornings. If you are familiar with radiator systems, either steam or water-based radiator systems, we can run hot water through and then have air move past the cold hot water tubes to go through and heat it up. We even have radiant surfaces. These were really very popular back in the early, uh, well, mid-century last year, or not last year, last century, when we were going through and we thought that we would have infinite power. So uh, we had the whole idea of all electric homes, we put electric coils, resistive coils in our ceilings that you could turn on and then your ceiling would get warm and kind of like uh, radiates and heat down as you. It was actually not a very efficient system, but if we were going to have nuclear power plants on every corner, you know, electricity was not going to be an issue. We'd be able to have as, many, uh, as much electricity as we could possibly use. So that was kind of a popular way of doing that. We don't do that as much anymore, although not up in the ceilings. If we're doing radiation systems, we'll typically go through and run like hot water to a floor or something like that. And that's what we do in this building. We run the hot water to a floor to kind of bring it up to the basic temperature. There's also these chill beams, those are the ones right above us, in a way, they're kind of like the VAVs, but what they're doing is they're basically just providing kind of some place where our cold water has air running over it, okay, so that it actually keeps a cool bit of the tail end. If you're from Asia or a lot of parts of the world that use split systems, they'll have the air conditioning units or heating units up high on the wall in individual rooms and the uh, kind of compressor or, or the condenser sitting outside somewhere and like some piping running between them. But a very efficient way of doing it where everything's just handled kind of on a closed loop within the room. 
So we have things like that in terms of, oh, different ways of supplying heat, cooling, kind of similar sort of things. And the best strategy to use often depends on really what your heat source is. So if you have electricity, and that's expensive where you are, you may not want to be using an electric system. Gas may be better. If you, gas is very expensive, or propane is, maybe electricity sounds better for where you are. In climates like where we are, where we actually have kind of a chilled water plant and a central heating system for the whole campus, okay, it makes sense to run a lot of hot water or chilled water because we have a very efficient plant that's doing that, providing it for the whole campus, we just have to tap into it. Okay, so somewhere we're gonna get that heating or cooling kind of distributed to where we want. In terms of how we distribute it, I'll open one last file and let you go for today. And that is, just to show you, oh, if I go from the air handler variations to, I'm gonna go through some heating and cooling equipment, you'll find that there are several different examples there that you can take a look at, either multi-zone VAVs, chilled beams that are in there, some radiators in there. I'll talk next time about a radiant floor system. Pretty much that's modeling a series of parallel pipes running through a series of floors. Okay, that's pretty easy. But if you want to think about kind of more distributed systems that work with the air handler, it'll look something like this. Here's a Revit model that has the air handler supplying a lot of air to some different zones. And in this system, what we have going on is twofold. We have the supply air coming in, and the supply air is coming into this box right here. This is a VAV unit. What's going to happen is this is going to go through and have air blowing through it, but it's also going to have some either hotter heating or chilling capacity that's going to let us go through, and before the air gets distributed to this room, we're going to control the amount of air, maybe even heat it or cool it a little bit, so that the air going to this one room can be throttled or controlled so that uh, we get just the temperature we need in that room. Same thing is happening back over on this side. Okay. On this other side of the building, though, we illustrate just two different systems. In the lower right right now, you're seeing the idea of supply air coming in, it's going to the VAV, and then it's going directly to these air terminals. In this one over here, in the upper left right now, the central air is coming in, it's going to the VAV. In this sort of scenario, the VAV would just be controlling the amount of volume, not actually heating and cooling it, because what's happening is these guys out here at the end, those are chilled beams, okay? And they're doing the heating and cooling right at the end point for the room. And this is probably the most similar to what we actually have on the Y2E2 building. Is above us right now, there's some sort of a variable air volume unit that's controlling the amount of air, that, that air is flowing over the heating and cooling, and that's actually what's actually providing the final heating and cooling in this room. So by doing this, basically each of these different VAVs have a thermostat that controls it and control the amount of air, and also control the amount of heating or cooling kind of being applied to that air, and that's how you get sort of very individual control of all the rooms, as opposed to doing sort of one thermostat or one air control and temperature for the entire building. And by doing that, you get a lot more efficient in terms of what's happening there. So we will go back and continue to do some debugging about what's going on with my heating and cooling load report. It could be a lot of different things. It's definitely the peak heating and cooling, not necessarily total. So I'm going to do some playing around with my example to sort of figure out what I have checked in correctly because it's always like one checkbox away from what you really need. But it doesn't make sense. We'll go through and keep on debugging that. As you keep going into this week, please just uh, keep going on your uh, sort of finish up your structures. Get that looking good. If you have your basic air handling system in place and that's looking good, we'll review that together and really think about your heating, your cooling, and how all that works. A good goal for this week would be sort of finish up with sort of your air handling system, sort of your whole HVAC system. Gotta get that completed as we go through here. Because next week we're gonna turn our attention to plumbing systems and go ahead and pipe a lot of water in and take some water out. Okay? So we'll keep on going with a little more of HVAC next time, but then shift on over. So please use your time with your TAs, I mean, to go through and like uh, 
just uh, get caught up on whatever you need, but see if here you are relative to thinking about your HPAC systems. Okay, beauty. Let us adjourn for today. So let me pause.